Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Sportachino, our fact or fiction show. I'm Richard Parr, and we are going to be discussing all of the biggest stories in the Premier League that have happened over the weekend. We'll also look ahead to tonight's game between Brighton and Hove Albion and uh, Stoke City. But I've got West Bromwich Albion on my mind because in the last hour, West Brom have sacked Tony Pulis as their head coach after they were hammered by Chelsea 4-0. And we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about the, the victory by Manchester City. We're going to be talking about Manchester United. We're going to be talking about everything that has happened in the Premier League over the weekend. And I am delighted to say that joining us back on the programme again is the sports journalist Andrew Rayburn joins me. Andrew, welcome back to the programme. I feel very often that with this uh, return, you are almost the, uh, the bringer of bad news now that uh, Pulis has been sacked because, of course, something happened the last time you were on, didn't it? Yeah, that was uh, Ronald De Boer was sacked while we were uh, having a little chat about. Uh, we just we think we just discussed whether Crystal Palace should uh, get rid of Ronald uh, De Boer, um, and uh, then he went. So uh, um, Frank De Boer, uh, yeah, and uh, I mean, you'd say it bad news. I mean, it depends on where you stand on the West Brom front, doesn't it? But uh, um, yes, yeah, certainly I'm a bit of a managerial grim reaper. But then again, you you have these show on the Mondays and. Uh, um, Monday tends to be when they uh, they wield the axe. Yes, we had uh, Slavon Bilic go a couple of weeks ago. It wasn't a very good start for David Moyes in his first game against Watford yesterday. But there's now been five Premier League managerial casualties already this season. We're only in uh, November. Five have gone already. But let's start off the programme, Andrew, by talking about Tony Pulis. And we've put this out on our Twitter page, we are saying West Brom were right to sack Tony Pulis. Fact or fiction, Andrew? Well, I'm going to be controversial. I'm going to say fiction on this one. Purely, I mean, I'm not... People knock Tony Pulis, don't they, in his style of football. I'm not always a massive fan of it myself. Um, they also do come back to his record a lot. Um, and whatever you think of Pulis and his style of football, it has generally been effective. You could argue with some of the better players, um, more technical players that West Brom uh, have at the club that um, obviously they should be performing better. And certainly defensively against uh, Chelsea on Saturday, um, they were fairly woeful. Having said that, how do you stop Chelsea when uh, when they're in the, the got sort of goal scoring form they can be with uh, Eden Hazard and Alvaro Morata and the rest? But um, to my mind, Tony Pulis, I mean, he wrote, interestingly enough, in his programme notes um, on Saturday, um, it, it, it was almost like a, um, a reminder, if you like, of what he'd achieved at West Brom um, and what he was still hoping to do. And you could argue, well, it, that was maybe a plea, one last plea, knowing it wasn't going very well. Um, but equally, maybe um, uh, just a, perhaps a reminder of what you could potentially lose. Grass isn't always greener. Managerial changes are not um, specific sciences. You don't always get um, a response from a new manager. So many clubs have been through a number of different managers. I'm an Aston Villa fan, so I know that very well. Um, and nothing necess not necessarily everything changes overnight. So sometimes you have to be a little bit careful what you wish for. Prime example, of course, with all that uh, is um, Charlton Athletic with Alan Kirbishley. Now, of course, Kirbishley walked of his own accord, but um, so that, that was the, uh, they, they were halcyon days for Charlton. They didn't get uh, any further than that. No, and I'm, I'm sure as a Villa fan, uh, having gone through all the troubles you've been going through in the last couple of the years, you must have a little wry smile on your face this morning, Andrew. Um, in terms of the baggies or in terms of Villa particularly? I don't in know, in which, terms of the which, baggies. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, the, the, the country cousins from down the road, look, they're, they're, they're in the Premier League and we're not. You can't, you can't argue <laughs> with that, certainly. Certainly for the rest of the season, no matter how each uh, of our uh, respective sides do, that will always be the case this season. Um, but um, look, they, they, you know, they're, they're an established uh, Premier League team. Their fans will be saying, "We want a bit more than we're showing." Um, it's always difficult when you're a sports journalist going to different uh, different matches, and um, West Brom are about out of my patch, and I concentrate on West London uh, clubs, but. 
you know, um, it's difficult to follow quite how the fan, you know, take the fans' temperature all the time. Um, West Brom have chosen to act, um, and we shall see who they choose to get in. Interestingly enough, the early favourite is, of course, Sam Allardyce. Um, maybe, maybe the right sort of fit. Okay, we'll have to wait and see who they do bring in. We, we've got a comment here on the Periscope pie. Oh, Periscope page even, saying it was coming. I think they're probably right. I'm going to say it was the right decision, Andrew. I think it is fact. They haven't won in 10 games. That is not a good record. They won their first three, so they are actually flying high. Uh, I watched their game against Brighton. I think that was back in September. They looked pretty poor there. The thing which I find about this decision, why I think it's right in particular though, Andrew, is that Pulis is renowned for his defensive capabilities and yet they haven't really shown that and, and what I've found in the last few weeks is he's even been toying with his formation and that's moving from a four at the back to a three at the back and I'm thinking that has been your bread and butter. You know what your team needs to do defensively. You just need to get them in order and, and I don't think he's been able to do that. I think by playing around with the formations. I think a big problem as well is a lack of a goal scorer. I don't think Jay Rodriguez has been as good as they potentially had hoped. Rondon is a player who's, when he's on form, I think is a superb striker, but hasn't been this season. And I just think they need a, a change. But on the other side of things, Andrew, you also wonder what are West Brom's ambitions here? Now, mm. if it is to stay up, Pulis is the man who, who can keep you up. So if you're aiming for, for 17th place, why get rid of him? Because there's still quite a lot of games still to go. Well, exactly. And I, I, I think, you know, obviously I've alluded to his, his record, if you like. And that come, can become a bit of a cliche. It can be, um, particularly when sort of uh, national journalists, you know, they have their uh, friends, um, you know, in the management game and everything else. And it tends to be something people fall back on quite easily. But it is also statistically true, as you said. And um, I think the thing is with uh, managerial positions at the moment, um, obviously manage there's more managerial changes um, in December when teams are starting to look at who can, you know, maybe we'll trust another manager with the money in January. Um, but as you say, there are a lot of games between now and when the window opens, um, you know, it's a packed schedule. West Brom's situation could look decidedly different. And maybe that's what they're hoping for. Maybe they think we'll attract better players if our position is that much better um, come January. And they're giving the new man, whoever it is, ample opportunity to do so. It tends to also be, of course, that managerial changes are made before an international break. So they've got a little bit of time to, to sort of consider it. Although Everton are dragging their heels somewhat. Um as far as Pulis is concerned, I think he's a, a a victim, really, of the current three-at-the-back trend, which was obviously instigated this time last year by Antonio Conte mm. and has been taken on by everybody from Arsene Wenger downwards. So, um, virtually, apart from, obviously, a, a few notable exceptions. But Spurs have changed. You know, um, Manchester United have, suddenly, uh, have, have occasionally used it as well. Uh, look, Pulis should really go with what he knows. Um, and, you you know, you fit your formation to suit your players, um, you know, not the other way around. And um, talking about the attack as well, yeah, they've got some good players, but they are, you know, they are um, on their day players, as you say, hot and cold sort of players. Exactly. Uh, the next three games for West Brom, whoever will be in charge, Gary Megson is taking charge on a temporary basis. Of course, he is a former West Bromwich Albion manager and he has been Tony Pulis's coach assistant coach so he knows all about the club but he's got a very difficult game coming up he's going to be taking on a wounded Spurs at Wembley Stadium who lost to Arsenal 2-0 at the weekend just after that for West Brom perhaps they would have a permanent manager in charge after that but then they've got home games I believe to Newcastle yes and then Crystal Palace so those are two games which West Brom would like to think they could get some points um, at the, the away game at Spurs with the way they're performing at the moment, it doesn't look too good. But let's move on to that, Andrew. Of course, at the weekend, it was the North London derby, the big game of the weekend. It was the Saturday early lunchtime kickoff at the Emirates Stadium. Of course, Spurs have 
been above Arsenal for the last couple of seasons. They've been in pretty good form for most of this season, but it was a pretty comprehensive victory by Arsenal, 2-0 at the Emirates. So we're actually going to look a little bit ahead. We're going to look at what that result actually means. So our fact or fiction today is Arsenal will finish above Tottenham at the end of the season. Fact or fiction, Andrew? Uh, I'm going to say fiction. I think um, there's been, obviously, uh, it's been a game for Arsenal fans to uh, work out on what uh, what day uh, uh, it will be confirmed that Arsenal finish above Tottenham, as they always do. In fact, of course, when uh, Tottenham were pushing Leicester City for the uh, league title, Arsenal still managed to pick a, uh, in the league table uh, at the end of the season. And Arsenal fans joke Spurs are the only side that can finish third in a two-horse race. Mm. Um but last season, comprehensively, Tottenham were um, ahead of Arsenal. Arsenal, of course, finishing outside the top four. Um, and the debate sent, uh, shifted um, back and the focus and the heat shifted back on Arsene Wenger um, for his general sort of league position rather than obviously the comparison with Spurs. Um, is that just a one-off with Spurs? Well, they have consistently been up there uh, in, you know, over the last two seasons. They've been getting consistent results. Um, Arsenal can pull off those sort of uh, results like they did on uh, on Saturday. They played very well. It was certainly a definite off day for Spurs. It shows there's still life in Arsenal, um, which I think will be good for the Premier League, actually. Um, but Spurs remain, despite that result, they remain a point in two places clear of their rivals. What Spurs need to do, of course, is to sort out the away form against the, the, the very top sides. Um, and, and that has been an issue uh, for Mauricio Pochettino, uh, whether it's something you need to look at in terms of his setup, whether it's you know a mentality thing, um, but Arsenal beating Spurs will, I think, go down as a blip for Spurs. Personally, um, I think Arsenal could still, you know, reach their you know usual goal of top four and whatever, and how that um, dictates Arsene Wenger's future at the end of it, I'm not entirely sure, but um, I do think that Spurs will. Uh, finish above Arsenal at the end of the season. Yeah, I agree with you as well. So I, I'm saying fiction um, along the same lines as you, Andrew. I personally think Spurs have got a better side. I think they've got a better squad. I was really impressed with the performance of Alexis Sanchez. You saw even when they were 2-0 up, when he was through on goal and, and had a really good chance, then he started fisting the ground <laughs> in fury when he couldn't get the ball afterwards. It showed how much it mean to him whether he'll still be there beyond January. And, and there are also rumours of Meza Ozil being linked to Barcelona. Of course, both of their contracts run out next summer. So from January the 1st, they have the opportunity to talk to other clubs. So we'll, we'll have to see what happens there. But the, the, the one thing which I, I was also thinking about here, Andrew, is obviously Arsenal aren't in the Champions League. And I know Spurs have been doing pretty well and... and They'll be through to the next round, but is that going to keep them, uh, you know, are they not going to be able to concentrate on both of these fronts where Arsenal have got the Europa League and they've pretty much been putting out a second string for all of it. Uh, will that help in any way, do you think? It, that is an interesting angle to it, actually, and, and um, it, we'll obviously wait and see what happens with Spurs um, uh, in the when uh, you know when the Champions League uh, knockout stages uh, comes around and and how long they're in it for and everything else, um, um, if that's uh, what happens. So look, it's still early days in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, mid to mid to late November is not necessarily um, a, a good signpost for what will, ha will happen come May. Plenty of twists and turns to come this season, without doubt. Um, there, that is a factor, extra European football. I mean, it's what helped Chelsea last season, um, not having European football uh, at all, of course. Um, the irony of that being that Jose Mourinho was complaining that Chelsea had all the time in the world to prepare for matches. And, of course, it was largely down to him that they didn't have European football. Um, but as for Arsenal and Spurs, you know, there's another North London derby to come later on in the season. And I just think that Arsenal have the potential at the moment, to have to have more silly results than Tottenham. Um, and I think um, there'll be more frustration for, for Arsenal at the Emirates than I think there might be for Spurs at, uh, at Wembley. Yeah, 
Well, yeah, of course, are kind of predicting the future. We've got a few more predicting of the future coming up as well. But we're actually going to reflect on something that happened over the weekend in just a moment. We're getting some hellos on the Periscope page. Uh, hello to you if you're saying hello. And of course, if you've got any opinions about whatever happened over the Premier League weekend, we're talking about all of the big talking points from this weekend and one of the big results again was Manchester City they remain unbeaten could they be the next Invincibles we'll have to wait and see they won 2-0 away at Leicester but there was a bit of a defining moment in the game where Jamie Vardy was taken down by Vincent Company. Company was only given a yellow card but there have been a few people going out in the media, such as Alan Shearer saying it should have or could have been a red card. So that is what we're saying. Vincent Company should have been sent off for Manchester City in their win over Leicester. Andrew Rayburn, what do you think? Is that fact or is that fiction? That, Richard, is fact. Um, and I'm going to make no bones about it, really. Um, having said that, there is um, something I'll come on to in a minute because I've been a good think about this one. Um, there is slight mitigating circumstances um, for the referee. Um, now, I've done a bit of refereeing myself, only at part level. Um, I know how hard the job can be. Um, obviously, people would say, rightly, that the very top referees in the land should get the very big decisions uh, right. Um, in this instance, I don't necessarily buy into the fact that it was because it was early in the game. Um, what I, You've got to bear in mind that the referee has to take into account um, a few... Uh, factors with denying a clear goal scoring opportunity. Um, now, the distance um, from goal that a, an attacking player is, the direction of uh, travel, if you like. So, a lot of people say, well, why, is, why wasn't the goalkeeper sent off? You know, he's going to go round him and tap it into the empty net. Well, of course, if he moves the ball away from goal, it's normally not a red card because you're not, it's, it's a clear goal scoring opportunity. That word is there for a reason, not just a goal scoring opportunity, a clear goal scoring opportunity. Um, does the attacking player have the ball under control and obviously the presence of any other defenders? And that is the crucial one because people talked about the presence of John Stones. Now, on replays, it's clear to me, I think, that Jamie Vardy would have got away from uh, Stones um, and obviously had a clear goal scoring opportunity. Now, the referee, when you look back at it, he is in a position whereby his angle might... Uh, sort of foreshorten the distance between company and Stones, making Stones look a little bit closer to company than he actually is. Also, you have to remember that at full speed and Premier League football, if you sit um, anywhere near and stands, you know, close to the touchline, you can do that in England. That's the great thing about the Premier League. You appreciate just how fast paced the game is at the top level. Mm. Um, he's brought down and then Stones is literally there within a split second and that can play tricks as well with the referee's mind so I think that the referee thought John Stones was going to cover across Vardy's pace needs to be taken into account um, and actually I think possibly I don't know how far we want to get into the debate about around VAR and everything else there might be a case on VAR for example um, if that, if the uh, rule you know if the, the if their jurisdiction was stretched to making these decisions um, that uh, a VAR might say um, that should be a red card, actually, because the angles that we've got are better to show that the actual law was, and the reading of the law was obviously uh, infringed by by a company there. So, it, look, it's one of those it's one of those ones where you're a Man City fan and you'll say, oh, well, Stones was was there, um, and Leicester fans would disagree. Certainly, Claude Puel wasn't happy. Yeah, completely understandable too. It's funny you mentioned about the speed of the players. I was at the game between Brighton and Manchester City at the start of the season, which was Carl Walker's debut. And to see him up close at the speed he goes is, is actually quite frightening how, how quick he is and, of course, how quick the, the game is played as well. I'm going to say fact, and I covered. I covered. Sorry, I was just going to say I covered Arsenal, Chelsea, the three nil actually that Arsenal won when um, uh, obviously Conte made the decision to switch the at the back at half time. But um, although the press seats are not quite at uh, certainly where I was anyway, not quite at ground level. Um, Hector Bellerin, I mean, my word, what an incredible athlete he is! Um, you know, his his speed across the ground 
um, it was something else that day. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he, he really is quick. And of course, Jamie Vardy is a very quick player. Uh, Vincent Company has only really recently come back from injury. Uh, for me, uh, I haven't seen every single angle. I have seen the incident, so I can't give as, as detailed analysis as you excellently put but i i think he should have been sent off as well fact and actually that might have made <laughs> this title race a little bit more interesting if he had been uh leicester were playing pretty well in that game did lose 2-0 at home it's looking pretty one-sided in this premier league title race at the moment eight points clear of course manchester united did have a 4-1 win over newcastle i was really impressed with Pogba and there was also the return of Zlatan Ibrahimovic but we're not actually going to talk about them for the moment we've only got 10 more minutes left of this show we've been discussing a lot of the major talking points we've got a couple more we're actually going to talk about Liverpool they won 3-0 at the weekend and it was Mo Salah with uh, two more goals He's got nine now. He is leading the Premier League goal scoring charts. Even though he's not a striker, he's got nine goals. Can he break 20? That is our question. Mo Salah will score 20 Premier League goals this season. Fact or fiction, Andrew? I'm going to say fact with the caveat of if he stays fit, of course. Well, I mean, that goes for any player. But he's got nine in 12 already, so he's made a, made a decent start. Um Liverpool do have, obviously, goals from elsewhere. The thing about Salah is, particularly in the last couple of games, he's got his goals in clumps. So, you know, he could get a couple in uh, a few more games and get even even closer. So he's certainly well on his way. Um, he's probably going to beat the tally that he's set in the last couple of seasons for Roma. He got 15 last season, 14 the season before that in Serie A. So he's, um, he's in rich goal-scoring uh, form over the last few years, certainly um, better than any other stage of his career. Um, so Mo Salah has been, um, you know, Liverpool, I heard actually a discussion, um, uh, overheard a discussion between Liverpool fans talking about where Adam Lallana might fit in when mm. he's, uh, uh, you know, and, and at the moment with the, the, the front players as they're, they're playing, it's um, very difficult to see where Adam Lallana, who was a key player for both Liverpool and England not that long ago, um, can actually fit in. But, um, you know, Salah, Coutinho, Firmino, um, you know, it's, that's a very uh, powerful uh, front three. They do miss chances, um, Liverpool. They don't score as many goals as they possibly should. Salah, though, is certainly uh, finding the net. Yeah, he is indeed, Andrew. And uh, I was looking at that Liverpool midfield and, and strike force, and I think that is their their strongest team as far as that's concerned. Of course, maybe not defensively, perhaps Joe Gomez ahead of Alexander-Arnold. I think Klopp is trying to give both of them a bit of time. I'm not sure Clavin would necessarily play where Matip's fit either. And personally, I think Liverpool need to strengthen that defence up regardless. But going forward, as you mentioned, there's some real talent there. If they can keep hold of Coutinho in January, I think that's really important. I think he's now had 31 assists for the club. I think that's maybe the third highest ever or something I saw. He, he is such an important player for them. And personally, I think uh, no Mane, no good. If Mane doesn't play, I don't find Liverpool very effective. His his pace, what he brings to that Liverpool side is, is frightening. Um, that's not to say Salah couldn't score 20 goals without him. Of course, he, he did get a couple against uh, West Brom and he was still scoring even when Mane wasn't playing. 20 goals is a is a high target for a, for an, a non-striker. So I'm going to say fiction but I think he might come close. I, I, like you said, it, the, the goals have come in clumps and, and you never know what can happen over that Christmas period. Lots of games might be rested for some of them. It, it could kind of not help him there, but he, he's certainly proven to be a very, very good signing for Liverpool. And, and they look exciting going forward. It's just I've got those concerns over their defensive capabilities. All right, I think we've got one more topic to go for. And yes, we're, we're, we're talking about managers. <laughs> we, we'll finish how we began. And we're going to be talking about West Ham United. David Moyes in charge for the very first time after he was appointed to replace Slavon Bilic. Uh, there's a lot of problems at West Ham. There's a lot of fingers being pointed at the board, at Golden, Sullivan and Brady. 
as to how they're running the club. But they were beaten on Sunday 2-0 at a, a really well-performing Watford side. Once again, Richarlison on the score sheet. Again, why I haven't brought him into my fantasy Premier League team, I'll never know, Andrew. Uh, that's why I'm I've floundering been... in the Sportacino fantasy Premier League. <laughs> Uh, at the moment, I had a terrible weekend. But let's not start about that. Let's talk about West Ham's problems. And uh, we, we are going to look again a little bit guesstimating looking into the future, Andrew. And we are saying West Ham will appoint a third manager before the season ends. Fact or fiction? I'm going to say fiction. I think, um, I think David Moyes will... Uh, last the rest of the season. Um, look, I think he's probably a man for a, a, a sort of a more longer term project than than trying to keep a, a side up. I do do think that that's a, um, a a bit of an issue. The key thing for West Ham will be. I mentioned this earlier um, in relation to pretty much most of the topics. Actually, it's about um, the fact that there's a busy schedule. Um, you know, we talked about Salah as well, um, uh, but. In the next sort of um, six to eight weeks, and it's the same every season, of course, there's going to be so many games. And there's going to be a lot of games for West Ham to try and pick up points or indeed be cut adrift from the rest before that January transfer window opens. The next um, two games, I think, for West Ham uh, are going to be crucial. Leicester and Everton, I think, are the next two, uh, both at home. Their home form is going to be important as well, obviously, trying to sort of get used to the surroundings there. Um, they've got three immediate, uh, tough games immediately after those two, admittedly. Um, but, you know, again, before January opens, uh, transfer window opens, West Ham's position will either be a whole lot better or a whole lot worse. And that will really influence um, who they can get in uh, over the over the summer, uh, sorry, over January. Uh, and then it will obviously m make a difference to Moyes' future. Um, West Ham's ire, of course, initially, um, you've got to give De Moyes a little bit of time. Um, is aimed at the board and um, you know they've got to really show their worth uh, in, in January back David Moyes to bring in who he wants to bring in and uh, you know then they'll sink or swim on that basis really. Mm. Uh, the thing with me though Andrew for West Ham is there is a lot of criticism over the board but they spent money in the summer Arnautovic hasn't been a brilliant buy, but he was nearly 20 minute, million. Who would believe during the summer that West Ham would be able to sign Javier Hernandez? Yes, Zabaleta's ageing, but he is still a, a very experienced Premier League player. I, I'm, I'm not Joe Hart's biggest fan, but again, it's a, it's a high profile signing. They have signed players. They have spent money. Yes, he probably needs to bring in a few of his players to fit his system. But ultimately, Andrew, my, my feeling there is David Moyes, his role, his job should be to get the best out of the players he has. What, what do you think on that? Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with you. I think it's very difficult to just get a you know, turn an oil tanker over, uh, around overnight. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm a Villa fan. I know what it's been like you look at the Villa squad that went down for example from the Premier League you would argue that you know that should have been a side that shouldn't have been in the position that it that it was or the, uh, um, the QPR in, side of a few years ago as well Andrew very very similar now no side as we know is uh, is too big to go down um, but Newcastle were another one um and there you go I mean Newcastle of course went down Benitez stuck around and he's brought them back up again. Now, David Moyes has he said himself in the press conference um, at his uh, um, when he was appointed that he has something to prove. Um, Moyes will be hungry to prove that. Now, he does need to bring in a few players. And you're right that West Ham did bring in a lot of... I mean, I'm not Joe Hart's biggest fan either. Um, but they did bring in a lot of high-profile players, which is why Billich carried the can. Moyes will need to get the best out of them. Yesterday's game against a high-flying inform Watford was not necessarily the easiest of fixtures. Um, and Richarlison is someone to bring into your, to, to your fantasy team, Richard. <laughs> Otherwise, I, start, I think another manager there might be under pressure, eh, Richard, if, uh, if, uh, if, your, if your team doesn't climb the, uh, the standings. But um, um, no, look, Moyes will, you know, Moyes needs this to go well. West Ham need this to go well. Um, the board, for their own personal reputations, need this to go well. So they all have to work together um, and back each other 
to try and get a very good team. This is, a, you know, some good players there um, out of the position they're in. If they're a collection of nobodies, as you quite rightly say, then, you know, you'd look at them and go, it's just, they're just not good enough. They are good enough to get out of this. So really, they've got it all pulled together. The big problem was, and you, very odd for, you know, a team under Slavon Bilic, defensively, they were a shambles. And that's the first thing that Moyes has got to sort out. Yeah, that's definitely something he's he's got to sort out. And again, we uh, I can bang on about the changing of formations all day, but Bilic was also doing the, oh, let's play four, let's play three, let's play four, let's... Nonsense. Stick with one of them. Um, um, personally, I'm a, I'm a back four man, but that, that's getting into <laughs> other things. But just taking a look at some of these fixtures right now, Andrew, for, for West Ham, where do you see them picking up points? I'm just going to go through a few of the games. We've got uh, West Ham at home to Leicester on Friday. There's a Friday night game. Then they've got Everton away. Then they've got Man City away. Then they've got Chelsea at home. Then they've got Arsenal at home. <laughs> Well, I mentioned that I mentioned the Leicester and Everton games, um, and I think they're very important ones. Obviously, um, when you look at the respective positions of those two teams, um, and they're t- games that a we- you know a West Ham side um, should be um, on paper, um, you know, competitive in against those two sides, and they should be able to pick up um, you know points from those games. Um, Anybody is going to be second favourite against the other sides that you mentioned there. That's the that's the that's the issue. Um, but they're almost free hits, if you like. I know West Ham, you know, are in a dodgy position. But if they can pick up points against uh, Leicester and Everton, suddenly those bigger games they do become free hits. You can perhaps try a few things out. Um, uh, you know, gamble on a couple of players to see what you know, and just go look. If we're going to get beat, we you know, then you know we're going to try and go at you know go at those teams, um, and maybe something will happen. Um, sometimes David Moyes is perhaps being criticised for being a little bit too um, inhibited. So, um, but there's plenty, as you say, there's plenty of a, uh, attacking talent in that West Ham team. If they can harness it, find the right shape. But the thing is, I mentioned January, there's lots of games to come before then. And a West Ham side that's bottom of the league, dare I say, uh, come December the 31st, is not going to be an attractive proposition, whoever the manager is. No, definitely not. Andrew, it's been really good to get your thoughts and your expert opinion on today's Sport of China. Why don't you just remind us where we can continue to follow your work and find you on social media, please? Um, I'm on uh, Twitter to, for, all the, um, for all the usual uh, um, uh, brickbats and abuse, uh, Andrew underscore Rayburn. <laughs> and um, um, I'm, yeah, I do I write for the BBC Sport Online and uh, West London Sport as well. I was at QPR Villa uh, on uh, Saturday. I shall be at Fulham Millwall next weekend. Well, having listened to what you've had to say today, Andrew, I don't think anyone should be abusing you or could be abusing you. (laughs) But you never know. It's a fickle world. Andrew Rayburn, sports journalist, thank you so much for being on Sportachino today. Pleasure, Richard. Really good to talk to Andrew on today's Fact or Fiction on Sportachino. Of course, we would love to get your views. You can continue doing that on our Twitter page at Sportachino. Also in the comments section on Facebook, YouTube, and you can watch this back at Sportachino.com. Got a few more plugs for you just before we go. Of course, we have interviewed over 180 sports stars, journalists, and influencers on the Sportachino network. And we want to tell you how we have done that. We do it in an article which you can sign up for. Just head to sportachino.com. All of the details are there. Plus, I've got a few events coming up, especially if you are in the Sussex area. If you're in the Brighton area, next Monday, I will be hosting a talk on how to interview famous sports stars. I've spoken to the likes of Manny Pacquiao, Rafael Nadal, George Foreman, and I'll be talking about some of my interview techniques, how to prepare for them, and how to arrange some of these interviews. Tickets are still available. Take a look at sportsachino.com. Also have a look at Eventbrite. That's where you can get your tickets. It's £20 for adults, £12 for students. It would be wonderful to see that it is in Brighton. So please come and join us. I think that's most of the plugs. Best in the world with Rich Parr is back on Thursday. Fact or Fiction is with you again next Monday at 11 GMT. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. All right, until then, I've been Richard Parr. I hope you have 
a wonderful week. Goodbye.